Good evening and welcome to Black and Asul, episode number 51. Charles Wolin coming to you with the rest of the team. A 7-1 thrashing tonight, the worst performance, uh, club record uh, worst performance for the San Jose Earthquakes tonight. Losing at the hands of the Seattle Sounders, the defending MLS Cup champions, by the scoreline of seven goals to one. So much to break down, so much to talk about, so much to analyze here. Uh, just utter disaster. Um, but but where to begin ultimately. Um, I want to uh, welcome the rest of the team here, Joel Soria, Alex Morgan, Jamin Moore. Um, Joel Soria, let's start with your take on tonight. I thought that tonight the Quakes didn't lose their way. Uh, they stayed on cue. Uh, this is who they are and who they've always been under Jesse Fiorinelli. Something has to give now. Something really has to give after this 7-1 humiliation in Seattle. I think that players, technical staff, coaches, whomever it is, if they have any dignity whatsoever, I think they should step aside or they should start pressuring ownership like never before. This is one of the lowest points in the San Jose Earthquakes history, a club that dates back to 1974, a club with a ton of history, with some silverware, with a lot of heritage, but at the moment with no feature. I absolutely agree, Joel. Um, this performance was embarrassing, shocking, shambolic. I don't have a large enough vocabulary. Uh, and I'm, actually, I'm actually curious how our audience would characterize this performance. Who can come up with the most creative description, that most accurate adjective? Uh, but before we do that, I actually have to run to Matias Almeida's press conference, uh, and I'll be reporting to you live, but he is starting right here, so we'll bring you everything he is saying live. Appreciate that very much, uh, Alex. And um, uh, Jamin, I think you have the press conference on as well, and, and Joel in the background as well. So just, just so everyone kind of knows how this is going to go, uh, we'll kind of weave in um, our coverage with with the press conference as, as we get our questions in, because I know that uh, Jamin, Joel, and Alex want to get questions into to Matias Almeida. Jamin, uh, good evening to you from your couch over there. Um, and uh, how would you characterize uh, tonight? Oh, sorry. Let me come off mute here. Yeah, it was absolutely. You know, I think it's the lowest point that I've personally seen uh, for the San Jose Earthquakes in the last few years. The, the league has figured out this, the Matias Almeida system. It's, it's, there's no other way to do it. I don't really know uh, how this is going to, to go otherwise at this point, other than Matias is going to have to decide whether or not he's going to fall on his sword for a performance such as this. That's, that's what most coaches would do in this situation if they had a guarantee type contract. We're hearing from Matias Almeida at the moment. Coaches should always be responsible for the moments. Somos nosotros los que elegimos 11 jugadores para arrancar el partido. It's us who choose 11 players to start the game. Realmente nosotros hemos tenido un torneo bueno en Orlando donde el equipo jugó a lo que pretendíamos. We really had a good tournament in Orlando where the team played in the way that we were looking for. El regreso de este torneo realmente eh, estamos muy mal. The comeback to this season, we're really doing very badly. Cuando hemos alcanzado un nivel de, para ser competitivos, competitivos eh, es porque defensa, medio y ataque jugaban a lo mismo. When we reached the level to be competitive, it was because defenders, midfielders, and attackers played the same. Y hoy no, no hay ni defensa, ni medio, ni ataque que, digamos, que, que haya jugado mejor que otros. El entrenador y todo el equipo, hoy realmente, eh, el entrenador que soy yo, el, el equipo funcionó muy mal y hay que hacerse cargo de esto. Today there's no defense, midfield, or attack who's playing that the same, and there's also a coach who, who is me that has to be responsible in that fault. El tiempo de trabajo que tenemos muy corto. The, team, the time we have to work is very short. Eh, tenemos que pensar bien de qué manera poder revertir esta situación. We really have to think of how to overcome this situation. Pero bueno, eh, 
de la única manera que se sale de todo esto es eh, dándole confianza a los jugadores, apoyándolo. The only way to get out of this is to give the players confidence and support them. Y de algún lugar sacar más fuerza de la que estamos mostrando hoy. And from some place gather more strength than what we've showed today. Thank you, Matias. Now let's go to Alex Morgan. Hi, Matias. Uh, there were a lot of times today when the players didn't look like they were defending. They were just watching the ball as Seattle players ran by them. What goes through your head when you see things like that? Hubo muchos momentos donde pareció que los jugadores estaban defendiendo, defendiendo solo parecía que estaban mirando a los jugadores de Seattle pasándolo. ¿Qué te, qué te pasa por la cabeza cuando ves eso? Bueno, obviamente muchas cosas. Obviamente, many things go through my head. Eh, vuelvo a marcar y a remarcar que el responsable de, digamos, de poner a 11 jugadores en la cancha soy yo. I reiterate, the one responsible to fielding 11 players is me. Hoy un equipo jugó como último. Today a team played like the last team, the last place. Y Seattle jugó como último campeón. And Seattle played as the last champions. Como un equipo que viene luchando todos los torneos con una mentalidad y un sistema de juego desde hace cuatro años. A team that's been fighting for in, in every season the same way for the past four years. Y nosotros hemos hecho un cambio negativo, no positivo, porque jugamos este año dos veces con Seattle. We've had a negative change, not positive, because we played twice against Seattle this year. Y si miro los dos partidos que jugamos de campeonato y en Orlando, y miro este, eh, realmente eh, son dos equipos diferentes. And if I were to look back to the game we played in Orlando against Seattle, and I look at this game, you really see two different teams. Thank you, Matias. Let's take one more in English before we move on to Spanish. Good, uh, Jamin Moore. Uh, Jamin, it actually looks like you have a connection problem. So we're going to have to move forward to Spanish. Joel Soria. Unmuted. Buenas noches, Matias Almeida. Joel Soria desde San Jose. Buenas noches. Eh, le tengo dos preguntas. Eh, la primera sería... Sabiendo que esta es la peor derrota de, de la historia de, de la organización, eh, ¿cuál es el siguiente paso que, que hace Matías Almeida y su equipo y también la directiva? Y la segunda sería, eh, ¿qué le dice al aficionado que demanda eh, sí o sí cambios estructurales? Muchas gracias. La primera, lo primero que vamos a hacer es regresar a, a, a San José. Hoy no se puede cambiar nada. Esto es eh, ni tan enfórico en los, en los momentos que hemos estado con un nivel competitivo. Eh, y hoy muy pensativo con respecto al presente y al futuro. Eh, hoy no se pueden provocar cambios. Acá queda un torneo que se juega cada tres días. Tenés dos días para entrenar. Entonces el cambio va a ser muy poco. Es la realidad. Al aficionado, como yo dirijo y he jugado al fútbol como un aficionado. Entonces, aquellos que me conocen saben el dolor interno que me causa perder y sobre todo perder de la manera que estamos perdiendo. Eh, trataremos de, en, en todo momento, tratar de cambiar, tratar de, de buscarle la manera para salir de esta situación. Nadie quiere perder. A nadie le gusta eh, perder de esta manera, porque hay maneras y maneras. Eh, y solo queda, digamos, trabajar poco, lo que tenemos por trabajar, y darle confianza a los jugadores para, bueno, para que salgan arriba de esta situación. Thank you, Matías. Let's take one last question uh, from Carlos Ramírez. Profe, buenas noches. ¿Cómo le va a Carlos Ramírez de Telemundo de San José? Un fuerte abrazo, profe. Buenas noches, Carlos. Profe, también un par de preguntas. Sí. Primero una corta. Eh, ¿Es el momento este más complejo de su carrera como entrenador, profe? No, yo he vivido momentos difíciles, momentos de dificultad. Nosotros hace... ¿Cuánto, cuánto hace que terminó el torneo de Orlando? Estábamos hablando de otra cosa después de cada partido. Y, y hoy el presente es, es real. Y cuando el presente es real, 
hay que afrontarlo, pero he, he vivido diferentes momentos en mi vida, creo que, en mi vida deportiva hablo, ¿no? Eh, he pasado por momentos de dificultad, no tan grande con tantos goles en contra como en esta ocasión, pero bueno, creo que siempre busco la manera para que me deje un aprendizaje. Este aprendizaje que me está dejando es doloroso, pero no imposible de cambiar. Y, y la segunda, profe, ¿cómo disierne, por ejemplo, me voy al gol en el cuarto del, del partido, en el que había tres atacantes de Seattle delante de Daniel y cuatro defensores detrás, de, de forma inexplicable? ¿Cómo discernir si esa falla es física del, del, del jugador o si es de motivación o de concentración? Bueno, lo que hemos hablado previo al partido, nosotros le dedicamos mucho tiempo, la verdad, pero igual los responsables, siempre digo, los responsables del entrenador, porque es quien elige a los 11 jugadores que van a entrar. Después hay mucha información con respecto a los rivales, y ya pasa por la interpretación. Si ustedes recuerdan, después de cada partido que hemos jugado a un buen nivel, siempre les he remarcado la interpretación de los jugadores. Cuando la interpretación es buena, cuando se hace lo que planificamos, sos competitivo. Cuando estás lejos, sobre todo un equipo como este, con los que hemos jugado y marcás a tres metros en vez de a uno, como tenemos planificado, cuando tenés la pelota en vez de, en vez de dársela a un compañero, se la da al rival, bueno, es difícil, pero se sale eh, de esta situación tratando de que ellos agarren confianza nuevamente y, y trabajar, yo le diría, se sale trabajando, trabajar se puede trabajar muy poco. Mañana llegamos, no podemos hacer nada, pasado mañana hacemos un entrenamiento, nos queda otro y ya jugamos otra vez. Entonces, el sistema este, a algunos los beneficia, a aquellos que tienen planteles numerosos y a otros nos perjudica. Bueno, nosotros es una mezcla de todo, pero no hay excusas, porque yo me estoy poniendo en primer plano y creo que, espero que lo interpreten. Okay, thank you, Matias, and thank you, Augustine. We'll be bringing in player to speak shortly. There you have the manager, uh, Matias Almeida, uh, speaking to press uh, here live on our program. Um, thank you um, to, to Joel, Jamin, and, and Alex for being able to, to, to patch us in there and ask some questions. Alex Morgan, I'll start with you here. Uh, he had a couple of um, quotes that, that you would like to, to share with the rest uh, of the group. Right, so some of the quotes that stood out to me uh, were that he was taking responsibility for this defeat. He was saying, uh, I think the, co the coaches are responsible for these moments. It's us who choose 11 players to start the game. We had a really good tournament in Orlando. To come back to this season, you're doing very badly. Uh, and a couple other quotes that stood out to me where he said there was no defense, no midfield, no attack today, uh, and that he wants to reiterate the one responsible to fielding the 11 players is me. And today the team played like the last place team. Yeah, he also said there's a big difference uh, between the team that played the Seattle Sounders in Orlando and the team that uh, he put out there um, this evening. Um, Joel Soria, you had a chance to, to ask a question in, in Spanish. Um, uh, if you could just paraphrase and translate uh, that for us. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I'm mostly paying attention to his body language. It, it, it looks like he's frustrated, but at the same time, it doesn't look like his job is at risk. It doesn't look like he's running uh for for his life you know he he talks about patience he talks about um you know making sure that the players work harder than they did tonight in order to come out of this nightmare he recognizes that the team fell short that this loss hurts more than other losses that this isn't the way to lose but he did say that he has had lower points in his managerial career at least in his playing career um not encouraging words really from matias almeida it just sounds like a a coach who really doesn't have any anywhere else to go. This is this is what he has to work with. Uh, he knows he doesn't have a roster as deep as other teams in MLS. And he said it in one of the last phrases there. He said, you know, that, um, that the team isn't as deep as other teams, but that it is what it is. And they're going to have to keep working hard. With hard work, they're going to be able to get out of it. Um, it, it, it's really, it's disappointing, I, I think, for, for a fan to, to hear this from, from Matias. 
Um, there's just no solution in sight. There's no plan B. Uh, plan A is all they got, and plan A is falling off the sky faster than we can imagine. From what you say there, Joel, and from what we've seen in the chat, uh, there seems to be uh, certainly a little bit of a, a mixed reaction to to Matias Almeida. Um, Eric Santiago says Matias um, needs to leave. Um, Jesus Rojas says, does Matias deserve better? Do the Quakes not deserve him? Um, from them, from from those two there. Art G, he also uh, is writing, I'm not mad at Almeida showcasing the roster. It's showing us what we've known for at least three years now, man to man. We do not compete. We are not going to win with inferior athletes every single time. So where does, Joel, you, you just reported on Almeida's body language. Where does Matias Almeida fit in 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 all of this um he, he obviously took a little bit of blame with his comments and he and he says it's it you know the coach picks the 11 from your question alex but where does matias almeida stand right now look i i think he got his tactics wrong tonight absolutely and and obviously we have to also tip our hat to the sounders who played a phenomenal game um then again i'm not sure we should praise them too much because they were simply just walking past the uh the last four in the back uh and and the goalie between the sticks uh daniel vega he did not have a good game at all no one on the field had a good game at all for the san jose earthquakes now here's the thing i personally do think that now is definitely not the time to call for matias to get sacked now is not the time to ask him to resign now is not the right time to question um, his pedigree. Matias Almeida is the 2018 CONCACAF Coach of the Year, um, the men's 2018 CONCACAF Coach of the Year to be exact. He is the best coach that the San Jose Earthquakes could possibly get under John Fisher and Jesse Fiorinelli. There are no doubts about that. Now, obviously, uh, the biggest flaw in all of this project quote unquote is that the ownership is not backing Matias Almeida 100%. As I said in the last episode, Matias had a serious purse at Chivas. I mean, you're talking about signing, essentially having a team with six, seven, eight, 90 P's. And now you're looking at a San Jose team that has maybe one in Cristian Espinosa and he has fallen short this season as well. Uh, obviously, it doesn't help that Jesse, uh, you know, signed a handful of players to some bad deals, and now they're the dead weight uh, around Matias's weight, uh, around his waist. You know, you, you have to feel for him, um, you know, to a certain extent. But then again, like I said, he did not get his tactics right tonight. There is no excuse about that. I, I think a, a loss like this, the blame for a loss like this, goes right the way up to the chain of command to the, to the very top. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of comments, uh, a, a, a lot of commenters saying that they want Fisher out. Uh, and I think it's clear that if he does not invest more money into this team, the Quakes will never be competitive. They'll never be a, a top four, top five team in MLS uh, that are consistently making the playoffs. So I think uh, it goes, the blame goes right the way up to the top to, to John Fisher and the ownership group. I think a lot of blame also goes to Jesse Fiorinelli because he's been in charge of recruiting for the last four years for this team. And clearly the players in this roster are not good enough. The team does not have enough depth. But again, that also shouldn't take away from, uh, to take any blame away from Matias because he, as, as Joel says, he absolutely got his tactics wrong tonight. Uh, I think- It's also worth noting that, we, that, that some pressure needs to be put on the players as well. I mean, some of the performances tonight were simply inexcusable. Luis Felipe, I mean, come on. You get handed the opportunity of your lifetime. You haven't had this opportunity under Almeida, and you completely let it fall through your hands in a way that no one could have ever imagined. You just cannot do that. There is no way, there is no way that Luis Felipe is going to get another minute with Almeida. But then again, you never know. I feel well, like look, we're what, with, a, with a starting spot next week. I think that there are players that have made m more mistakes than Luis Felipe made tonight. I don't think that Paul Marie should be starting. 
I don't think that Daniel Vega should be starting. I don't think that Luis Felipe should be starting. I don't think that Marcos Lopez should be starting on the same side as Vaco. Those are all obvious observations. And it's baffling to me why Matias Almeida is unwilling to make those changes. So as bad as Luis Felipe's performance was tonight, you know, last weekend, Matias Almeida told us that he doesn't he doesn't change players. He doesn't drop them because of mistakes they've made. So uh, it's just it's just a baffling situation all around. So look, the fans are right to say Fisher out. The fans are right to say Fiorinelli out. The fans are right to say Almeida out. The fans are right about all of it. The question is what's actually going to be able to happen because John Fisher is not going anywhere. He owns the team. He's not going to get forced out because the Quakes are There's no plan B, Jamin. There's no plan B. I understand there's no plan B, but let me finish, Joel. Fiorinelli, at this point, is tied to Almeida. And if Almeida falls on his sword, walks away, or even if Fiorinelli wants to fire him, Fiorinelli is not going to get another chance to hire another coach. You're going to end up in a situation where it's going to take a new GM who's going to bring in probably his coach, right? Probably the people who should get a look at it within the organization will not get a look at it as a result. The problem is at this point that Matias Almeida has no plan B tactically. The league knows exactly what he's going to do. Nothing really changes. It's the same system. We've talked about how the man marking shifts and things like that, but clearly tonight, nothing that Quakes did was effective. The best thing that happened was Tommy Thompson got to play at the 10 for a little bit. I mean, that was, that was the best thing. And his, his penalty shouldn't have been called. It was actually, it was, you know, VAR actually overlooked it. They're feeling sorry for the quakes, I think. So, you know, you're right, Joel, there is no plan B. The problem is at this point, I don't know what change is going to be able to be made without Almeida voluntarily walking away. That's what it would take for any change to be made at this point. And that means that we're going to be stuck with the way that things are for at least the rest of this year. And then maybe other options will be evaluated in the summertime. I don't think John Fisher is going to swallow the money that it would take to buy out the contracts of Fiorinelli and Almeida and start from, start from scratch. I just don't see him doing it. And he's not going anywhere. Understand that Chris Wondolowski is um, making his post-match comments here. So when we get a chance, we'll patch uh, patch that audio in for you. I just want to give you guys a couple comments. Uh, keep commenting, keep sharing your thoughts and your feelings uh, with us. Um, and right, uh, this is that. Wando, thanks for being with us. Uh, we can go ahead and get started right away. Let's start with Robert Jonas. Hey, Chris, first off, I hope your uh, head's doing well. I know you took a shot there near the end of the game. Um, but um, I was, you know, woke up this morning and realized today was the uh, the 15 year anniversary of your first MLS appearance. And, uh, for me, that that seemed like a was going to be a good way to start the day, and hopefully there'd be a great way to finish the day. And I think we can say that didn't happen. Um, when it comes to a game like this, and you've seen a lot of highs and lows in, in your time with the Quakes, you know, how does a result like this stack up? And, and what, do you, what do you say? What do you say to your teammates? What do you say to fans as a, as a response to, to what we saw tonight? Ooh, um, first of all, thank you. I appreciate the, that memory and uh, I appreciate the tweet. I saw that. That was uh, pretty cool. And boy, does time, uh, time fly. I felt like that was just yesterday. But um, to be honest, uh, speechless, embarrassed. Um, I want to apologize to our fans. They deserve better to have to watch that and endure that for 90 minutes. And, uh, you know, for our, our team, we we got we to start from uh, square one. Uh, you know, we, we built up uh, so many valuable morals and lessons that we need to implement into our game plan. And... Uh, when, when the whistle blew, we kind of let that all go out the window. And, uh, you know, to be honest, that's a lot on me, the captain, uh, making sure we're ready, making sure we're sharp, uh, ready for the little things. And, uh, you know, we think we were lackadaisical all over the field. And, uh, you know, it showed, uh, you know, I think that credit to Seattle. Seattle is a, an amazing team. They're, they're the champions for a reason. Um, you know, all the credit to them. 
it was embarrassing for us. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, Wanda. Let's go to Alex Morgan. Matthias, you guys have been saying that, you know, you have to keep doing what you're doing and the results will come. Does a result like this make you question that? Like, what do you think needs to change at this point? So, uh, no, I mean, I think that we need to execute the game plan. I think that that's the biggest difference. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, being close and be having near the idea isn't good enough. And again, you know, we kind of harped on it at the beginning of last year. If you don't have 11 guys all on the same page that buy into, into it, then you're going to get exposed. But when you do have 11 that buy into it and all 11 are doing, executing the game plan as uh, – as need be, then you get some pretty amazing things. And when you play unselfish and, and do that, it's uh, some special things happen. But uh, when it doesn't, it's a fine line between between the have and have nots, especially in this league. And uh, right now, uh, we're getting punished, and rightfully so. And it's uh, it's not good enough all across the board. Thank you, Wando. Let's go to Joel Soria. Unmuted. Hey, Chris. Good evening. Um, Chris, is it is it fair to say that this is one of the darkest nights in Quake's history? If so, where does the team go from here? Muted. Oh, um, I don't think it's one of the darkest. I mean, it's it hurts. It's uh, you know, it's it's a painful night. You know, I think that uh, you know where this club is and where the strides we have taken, it's still headed in a great direction and. The, those strides are still along the way and still on the right path. Does tonight hurt? Yes, absolutely. Tonight's an absolutely a gut blow. It uh, again, it 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 hurts me. It, it hurts. It hurts my ego. It hurts. Uh, it hurts everything. Uh, you know, this this one is going to keep me up at night. Um, and again, th this one's on me. And you know, I got to make sure these guys are ready. Um, you know, and myself are ready. I turned the ball over so many times in the middle of the field. There was. It was embarrassing. So, it would, you know, I think that we have a game Sunday. It's uh, another Classico, and we better become ready. It's uh, and it's not about just connecting passes, but it's about just the energy we bring, and that's been lacking as well. Thank you, Wanda. We're going to do two more questions. This one comes from Jamin Moore. Uh, you mentioned you need to execute the game plan. Where did that go wrong tonight? Um, a lot of it. So, a lot of its game plan is you know, scouting the team, knowing what their strengths are. We know that they like to overload the zone, but also like the third man running. So they like to play it into a forward or someone in, and then they lay it off and that person spins around and they executed it. We, we knew that was coming and our press uh, was, a, was a step late all over uh, each, each player. And when that happens, if you come late, they're good. They're, they're talented players. If you give them two yards, they're going to take that and exploit it. You need to be, you need to be in their shorts. You need to be right next to them so that they don't play that ball. Um, you know, I think that's first and foremost, and that's something that we pride ourselves on. And, uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't there all across, across the field. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just one player. It was all 11. And so it, uh, that definitely hurt. All right. Thank you, Wanda. We're going to take one last question here from Carlos Ramirez. Uh, hi, Chris. Good night. Carlos Ramirez from Telemundo and NBC Bay Area here in San Jose. Uh, what do you think happened? I mean, how would you explain it to people? What happened to that Golden Shorts team that we saw in Orlando that would mark their man within a meter of distance? And what changed beyond the fires, beyond the difference in, in rhythm, which we understand because of time passing by what do you think changed within the team <clears throat> sorry uh, i think the biggest thing that changed again is you know it, it's a fine line of when you're marking you know you can be a yard away and you think that you're close that's not close enough and that's the difference you know i think that we're trying to get away with just a little bit of the easy thing, try to do just the bare minimum. And that hasn't been our MO from the start. And I think that we need to, again, 
go back to what was what's been successful and a lot of it's just been our hard work and energy and you know we, we have to outwork teams we know that and that's one of our strengths and something again that we pride ourselves on and again we need to connect the easy passes and be sharp when we get it in our offense third but first and foremost we need to win the ball and when we do we need to keep the ball and and i know it sounds simple i know it sounds something that we should do but we we've been extremely bad at that lately and uh again i think that it's all over it's not just uh one one or two individuals all right wando thank you uh for being with us tonight and have a safe flight home and thanks for everyone for participating there you have the words of uh chris wandalowski uh the quakes eternal captain uh, scoring Goal number 163 this evening uh, from the penalty spot in the second half. He said, I want to apologize for our fans for having to endure that for 90 minutes. He said, we got to start from square one. And when the whistle blew, that all went out the window. He said, tonight hurts. It hurts my ego. It hurts everything. And at the end uh, with that last question, he was a little bit more tactical when approaching his comments, he said, first and foremost, we need to win the ball. And when we win it, we need to keep the ball. Jamin, I, I want to uh, start with you here um, after Wando's uh, comments. Clearly, you can see the comments, uh, lots of love uh, displayed to the eternal captain um, and, and taking a little bit of responsibility here, uh, the captain on the night. But the biggest bright spot for this Quakes team this evening, if, if there's anything um, of, of a silver lining. Yeah, I mean, Chris Wondolowski, I mean, what can we say about him at this point? He is the San Jose Earthquakes. I believe he always will be the San Jose Earthquakes. Build the statue right now, I think somebody said, you know, obviously, I think we all agree with that statement. Look, this loss is not Chris Wondolowski's fault. It started when, uh, and, and he mentioned it, he mentioned that they were a step slow to different levels of transitions. Ever since they've come back from MLS is back, and I would even say the last game at MLS is back against Minnesota, they've been a step slow in every one of those transitions. And here's the problem with the man marking system. When one person is a step off, it creates a chain of events where everybody is off. And Matias mentioned it the other night after the Colorado game. If this team doesn't bring 200%, they can't compete. So if you're a step off, and you're not even bringing 100% because I think we point the fingers at several players tonight that had mailed it in from the very first whistle, okay? there's You have no chance. This is what happens. This is how you create 7-1 losses, 5-0 losses on the road, 4-1, 5-2. These are bad losses, and they happen because everything is out of sync when one thing, when one player in this system is not in sync with everybody else, it's a massive chain of events. When it all works, like we saw at MLS is back a couple times, it's a thing of beauty. It's a ton of fun. But either the Quake, the, the Quake's fan base has to get used to the idea that we're either going to have fun wins and crushing defeats and score lines don't matter. We're just going to take the good and the bad. Or you, you have to get a different coach who's going to be more pragmatic to be able to manage the score lines and be able to bring various systems as necessary against various teams as required in this league. Um, and that's not who Matias Almeida is. And I don't know that he has the players that can bring him the 200% and not be a step off too often for this team to be able to be competitive. Really in a, in a, in a throwaway season where nine teams make the playoffs out of 12, it's pretty ridiculous. The Quicks are sitting in last place and the margin is getting worse. Jamin, I, this wasn't just a bad loss, though. This was literally the worst loss, the worst defeat in San Jose Earthquakes history. The first time they lost seven to one by six goals. And I don't think this is sustainable. I don't think routinely losing by margins of five nil by seven one is sustainable. And here's why. It's because this kind of performance has long term consequences. It has long term damage because it makes the Quakes a laughing stock in the league. And it'll make them significantly, it'll make it significantly more difficult for them to recruit new players this winter. Because nobody wants to be a part of a team that loses seven to one. Everybody can tell it's a sinking ship. And that's why I think at any other club, this is the kind of performance that would get a coach fired, because it's just so difficult to recover from, from a loss of this magnitude. 
It's it's tough to see the Quakes changing this season at all, to be honest with you. We know that Matias comes from the school of Marcelo Bielsa. We know who Marcelo Bielsa is. Most of us who have studied the game, who know the game, know who he is. And Bielsa once said, plan B is plan A, just done better. I think this is I think this rings true to what Matias might do in the future. He's not going to change his ways. I've seen a lot of pundits on Twitter, you know, reference how Matias's style has been figured out. Jamin, you've said that before. The man marking system is only going to go so far. The way that he likes his play to his players to play in the attack is only going to get him so far. But the reality is, is that Matias is stubborn. He's stubborn in his own ways. He's going to remain the same. Uh, we've seen that here in San Jose. There was probably an opportunity for that to change with the new scenery in this new league, with less pressure, with a chance to really flex those those new muscles. But he doesn't want to do it. I don't think he's going to do it. Um, and, and that's it, it's it's very it's very striking in a way um, because this team, as Alex you mentioned, is a sinking ship. And the only way to make it quote unquote sustainable is if you bring firepower to the team, but the ownership group isn't going to give you that. So where do you go? Where do you go from here? You know, it baffles me that Matias Almeida said no to Monterrey last minute when he had everything figured out. He had everything ironed out. He was just, it was simply just putting ink to paper. He decides to back out and not head that route. And when Ecuador came knocking at his door about a month ago, he also decided that it wasn't time to go. And yes, he might have his he might have his excuses. I mean, he might have his reasons, his very valid reasons. He has a family here. He's very stable. He's living the California lifestyle that many many people around the world um, desire. But the, the reality is is that this this team isn't isn't progressing, and his persona is taking a huge huge blow. Yeah, certainly. And um, clearly there's lots of comments about uh, Almeida out there. Uh, Jamin, you mentioned um, his style, his systems. Uh, Joel, you talked about um, the history of Matias Almeida and he comes from the school of BL. So we'll see, see leads in the, in the Premier League uh, just coming up this weekend against uh, the defending champions, Liverpool, and, and kind of get a taste of a little bit more of the style of, of Matias Almeida. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the ownership. Um, and, and I, I obviously see a lot of people talking about the ownership and, and, and the hashtag Fisher out here. Um, and there was a comment here from uh, Robert Blackburn that's just talking about pressure from from other uh, owners uh, as, as well. And uh, we'll read it to you once it uh, once it comes on our screen here. Thank you uh, to our producer, Jason Scholl, uh, this evening. Does MLS start to scrutinize earthquake soccer? Can owners pressure uh, one and not investing at the same time and writing the increase in value generated by almost every other team in MLS? And Robert brings up a really interesting point here because MLS uh, is, a, is a sole conglomerate um, as, a, as an entire uh, league. And so the interesting structure of this allows for Robert's comment to to potentially be be something that could be on the cards, um, obviously, um, Alex, um, I'm going to come to you with uh, with this comment um, and uh, wanted to hear your thoughts. Right, Charles. So I don't think that John Fisher will sell this team by his own volition, and there, and there are two reasons why. First of all, it's because it's making him a lot of money. Second of all, it's because he's making it's making him a lot of money, and. Uh, there are two ways it's making him a lot of money. First is that it's a great real estate investment. Along with getting the stadium, his real estate company is developing the plot of land adjacent to the stadium on Coleman Avenue. Uh, and I believe Verizon and Roku are moving their headquarters into those offices. So that is making him a lot of money. The second reason is, is because the valuation of MLS teams is skyrocketing. All he has to do is sit on this team and he will make millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the only way to, to get him to sell the team, to get a new ownership, is if other MLS owners look at the Quakes and say, hey, that franchise, it's bringing down the value of all of our franchises. If, if other owners can put pressure 
on the league, if the league can put pressure on John Fisher to spend money, I think that's the only way that we ever get any significant change in this ownership group. Alex is 100% correct. Um, I would recommend to everybody to uh, download a particular podcast. It's called 25 Stories That Made MLS. It's by Tutal Raman. Um, him and his brother did a great job documenting kind of the history of MLS. And in there, this exact thing is explained. It's talked about how this league is really built on the backs of real estate investments. Fisher owns all that land by the stadium. The Quakes are just one piece of that that unlocks the rest of it for him. Um, that land is being developed. And until that land stops increasing in value, there's no chance that he is going to want to sell the team. Now, Alex brought up another good point. If the league feels like it is, it is all of a sudden going to be something that is going to drag their investment down, that's what will speak to other billionaires. When other billionaires can't get as much for their investment, that's when they're going to bring uh, the heat on other billionaires, such as they recently did with the RSL owner because of his, his racist comments. And now all of a sudden it makes them all look bad. Of course, they're going to force him out. Do you really think that it was the black players for change? No. It was the league that was like, oh boy, we look bad here. We're going to need to, to get this guy out of here. Yes, the Black Players for Change were a part of that. The conversations, they were able to get players to sit out for a game and be able to protest. I think that made a big difference. But in the end, it's the money that talks. And John Fisher is going nowhere because of this anytime soon until the other MLS owners put that type of pressure on him. I just don't see that happening unless their investments are being dragged down. There's something interesting going on in Texas as well with the Houston Dynamo, you know, reports that surfaced uh, yesterday from The Athletic uh, indicate that the, ma the majority owner of the Dynamo is looking to sell his stake in, in the franchise. And I, I think that gives, I guess, some sense of hope for fans who, who might think that this can also happen to the Quakes in the future, perhaps in the near future, maybe in a long term future, who knows? Right, but I think that the Quakes are definitely inching their way closer to a rebrand. Look, I've said this before, the Quakes are in one of the hottest markets, one of the hottest professional sports markets in the world. And I mean, I'm not even talking about America, I'm talking about the world. Some of the biggest teams in the world come and play here, uh, you know, whether it's basketball, football as we know it, and soccer. All the biggest soccer teams, they come and they spend summers here in the Bay Area. The Quakes have not been able to unlock that. I think they've already hit their apex. They can't crack 60% at Avaya Stadium. They've tried and tried and tried again uh, through their financial strap and their financially strapped ways, and it's not working. You know, you, you can only be so um, frugal and, and and get so far, right? They've, they've, they've tried to do it the frugal way. It's not working. You have teams like the 49ers who have obviously had ups and downs, but they were able, they're able to sell out Levi's when they play well. It, let's not say the, the San Francisco Warriors, right, who have had a, a, a huge turnaround history when ownership changed. That's the potential of the Bay Area market. The Bay Area market is one of the most loyal, one of the most um, deep pocketed in the entire country. Unfortunately, the Quakes aren't reaping any of those benefits and it all has to do with their owner, but I don't think he's going to sell unless as Jamin and Alex mentioned, there is pressure from other owners in the league. It's sad I, I would reality. Add, Joel, I would add this. I, I think it's easy as a, a fan to lose hope. It's easy for fans to lose hope here because you know, if the ownership doesn't care about the team, then it's hard for them to ask fans to care about the team, right? And, and John Fisher, I've seen John Fisher once in my uh, six years covering the team now. He was at their announcement for Intermedia as uh, uh, their new kit sponsor earlier this year. That was the one time I've seen John Fisher in six years covering this team. I believe he's shown up at some other Quakes games, uh, but I haven't seen him. He is not uh, uh, you know, an active figure uh, around Avaya Stadium, around, sorry, Earthquake Stadium now. Uh, and it's it's very clear he's showing with his money that he doesn't care 
about this team. But I think as a fan, there is a way for fans to influence that. And that is for fans to protest, to, you know, to protest with their dollars, to organize protests. You know, I've seen on the San Jose Earthquake subreddit, people are making Fisher out scarves. The more that fans protest, the more that draws eyeballs to what's happening at the San Jose Earthquakes. It draws eyeballs within the league and that makes the quakes look bad. That makes John Fisher looks bad and that makes MLS look bad. And that is when other owners will start looking at this team and wonder what's going on here. Is this bringing down the value of my franchise? Yeah, a uh, couple comments uh, just, just coming in here about loyalty and um, Javier Leon says, I'm loyal, but if they keep this up, uh, uh, the pressure is going to to stop buying merchandise and, and, and going to games. Appreciate everybody for for tuning into our show. Uh, I think this is the the most watched show that we've ever had, um, episode number 51. Let's turn our attention here back to, to Jesse Furinelli because we talked about the manager, Matias Almeida. We've talked about Fisher and the ownership group. Um, Jesse Furinelli is, 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 has been at the club for a while. Um, he's had a few managers under his tutelage, and he's had the opportunity to, to sign plenty of players, um, et cetera. Uh, where does Jesse Fiorinelli stand with this um, this Quakes franchise and, and with this club? Uh, it seems to me that he's had quite a few chances as well um, and has been at the club for you know a few more years than than Matias Almeida. Matias Almeida is his guy, though. Um, so so where does he stand? What do we think here? I think he's going to live and die by Matias Almeida. Like I said, this is the fourth coach that he's had. For him to be successful, Matias has to be successful. Um, he has allowed Matias to decide which players within the budget that Fisher does allow uh, them to spend within, he's allowed Matias to select those players. Now, you can argue that that budget's not enough. You could argue that Matias selected the wrong players. You could argue a lot of different things, but the fact is it's not working. And I think they're going to get the rest of the season to be able to figure it out. I think they're going to get the opportunity to be able to try to get Matias the team that he wants. But that's all within the context of the contracts. That's why Matias is putting players out there to see if they fail. And in many cases, they are. I think we've identified several players who should not probably come back to this team. And if those their contracts are running out, they're going to be moved. Or they could be moved to Reno. Or all kinds of things can happen. But they better have their ducks in a row when it comes to the, the next set. We've talked before, they need that 10, they need that 9. You've got to fix the spine. Um, you know, the, the problem tonight was goals through the middle of the field. It was the spine. The spine tonight was not right. Now, was that one player at fault, Luis Felipe, adding him in there and him not playing in two years in, in a starting role? Maybe, you know, like, like, Wanda said, one step off is going to throw the whole thing off. But I don't think it was always Luis Felipe tonight. There were other things that were at play. And it's, it's you know, but these are going to be considerations for Matias Almeida. He's got to remember who he played in this game and who they played with and such. And, you know, if he's still the coach at the end of this season, there's still a lot of games to be played. And if they keep ending up like this, you can't imagine that he's not going to be tempted to walk away. But you know, this is, this is going to be something that he's going to, to, to decide. And, you know, then he's going to get his team and his chance. And if it's, if it's a failure like this next year, you know, at some point this project is going to be stopped. I don't, I don't think Jesse's approval rating is any higher than during the star era. But what I can say is that I think he's far removed, far, far, far removed from the hot seat. Uh, look, we, we cover a team that plays in a single entity league that has no promotion, no relegation, uh, no real consequences to those teams that fail miserably week in and week out or through a period of a handful of years like the San Jose Earthquakes. There, there's just really no repercussions at this point aside from one's ego taking a couple of hits here and there from various tweets from journalists, from fans, that's as far as it goes. You know, we, I, I, like I said, I wanted to stress Matias's body language. If the Quakes played in Liga MX and they went on and put, put on that performance, there's just no way, there's no way 
Matias and both Matias and Jesse walk away with a job. There's just no way that happens anywhere else in the world. Someone's out, someone's out the door and they're not coming back in. Um, but this, this says a lot about this team. I mean, we've, get, we've been going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for the last three years now, but there really isn't any whole, wholesale changes. I mean, we, we continue, the, the team continues moving forward um, with, the, with the same core, with the same values, with the same mindset, with the same structure, with under the same operations. Um, that's just the re reality of this league. I mean, you either spend or you don't spend, you either win or you don't win and you win or lose. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Nothing changes. The, the show continues, uh, next year they get rewarded with the number one pick in the super draft. You reward mediocrity and you clean your hands, you move on. Uh, here, here's what I think is going to happen, Joel. I think that there is a, a significant chance that if the team continues to lose this badly and um, Matias Almeida, for some reason, receives uh, a appealing enough offer from South America or some other league, I think that there is a, a decent chance that he leaves the Quakes this offseason. He, he moves on. He recognizes that this project was a failure and he could easily pin it on the owners that he didn't get enough backing, right? Now, if if Matias and Jesse Fiorinelli stay, then uh, it's another story. And I don't think that Jesse Fiorinelli will fire Matias Almeida because as we've said, as, as Jamin said, they're attached at the hip. Jesse is, he has banked his future on Matias Almeida, right? So how I envision it happening, if they both stick around, is that they will use the season as a, a a transition year to try to completely overhaul this roster. And if they can do that, then they're going to, it's, it's, it's do or die next year. And I think they will recognize that if next season they don't succeed, uh, then there's no more excuses. And I think uh, either both of them will be sacked or, or they will leave. Uh, I, I think it's unlikely again that they, either of them leave uh, this winter, either of them are fired this winter, and that's just because Matias Almeida has a giant contract with the Quakes, and and I, I can't imagine that the ownership group will want to buy that out. Alex, what you say has me thinking. I, I feel like there's someone in that chat who's thinking, who's on like full conspiracy theory mode and, and thinking, wow, maybe this was orchestrated, maybe this was pre-planned, and this only gives Matias and Jesse leverage this winter to buy more players, to, to open the purse a bit more, to put some pressure on Fisher. Perhaps that could be it. I don't know. I don't want to go into that territory, but the way that you you put that across to me uh, definitely, definitely made me think in, in that way. But we do know, right, that Matias has said that he's going to be trying players out and to see if they succeed or fail effectively. And so he's he's stuck by that. And and a lot of us wanted to see those players because we felt that Matias and and maybe even Jesse had been protecting a set of players from having any sort of consequence attached to them. Right. So if you're running out the same 11 like the Quakes did for the second half of last season, every single game, you're kind of like, well, where are the rest of these guys? at? Are they are they that far behind that they don't even get a chance? I think we're actually getting the answer to that question. And finally, right, because now we know which part of this roster is, is something that should stay. And I think everybody, including Matias and Jesse, or anyone who may replace them is going to have a good idea which part of this roster should not be returning next season. And now the question is, are they prepared to be able to fill those spots with the right players that are going to allow this team to be successful regardless of who the coach is next season. Jamin, Jamin, here's where you start. You start with Luis Felipe because his defending tonight was absolutely disgraceful. For the first goal scored by Morris, you know, he needed to drop and cover cover in the in the back the minute that Morris turned around Youngworth. For the second goal, he lost Lodero. But I think the first is the the fourth is the worst. It's just utterly shambolic. Uh, it was actually the play was live. He was one of the last men back and he was just watching. He was watching the ball 
He's literally standing there and watching. And if I were Almeida, I would have hauled him off right then and there. I think that's what the best managers, the managers with the most guts do. They make those tough decisions. I remember when Jose Mourinho substituted Eric Dyer at Tottenham after 27 minutes in a game last year. But Almeida was paralyzed. He didn't make any substitutions till like the 60th minute when they were down six or seven nil. Uh, and, and what's funny is actually, Felipe looked like he wanted a substitution. He was actually started to walk off the field when the Quakes made those five changes and then threw his hands up when he learned that he wasn't one of those substitutes. Uh, and, and it almost felt like Almeida was trying to punish him by keeping him in there, making him, uh, you know, sit in that in that disaster. Yeah, Alex, I completely agree with you. And and when I saw uh, Luis Felipe uh, playing tonight in central midfield, uh, he was just completely outrun, and um, his his tackle was just um, pretty poorly mistimed, uh, to be fair with you. And it, and it makes me think, you know, this team is very thin uh, in central midfield. You have Judson, you have Jackson Yule, um, and and you have Eric Calvillo, um, Luis Felipe. You know, I, I'm not so I'm not so sure, and. You guys have mentioned it before. There's lots of contracts expiring. Uh, there are lots of different shoes to fill um, in year number three of Almeida. Um, I've heard you guys say it before here um, on our uh, program uh, many, many times. Um, just want to, uh, for all the viewers that are, that are tuning in, if you could uh, like and subscribe to our channel, that would uh, be really awesome. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. I think we're at uh, 111 people tuning in. Uh, this is our biggest show that we've ever done this evening. Um, keep commenting, uh, keep sharing your feelings and your thoughts uh, with us um, as, as, as well. Um, and I'll just bring up a, a question here and then we'll get into final thoughts. It's from Ren1018. He says, was Magnus the glue for this team? Uh, I'll just quickly take it and we can do a whip around and, and have some final thoughts this evening. Uh, certainly looking like it, uh, the little passing that he, that he had and the way that he fit in this system and the way that Almeida got uh, a lot out of Magnus Eriksson. And that's quite clear they haven't replaced him yet. And there's no player that has stepped up uh, yet in his uh, place. Let's uh, have some final thoughts and, and, and wrap this up uh, for this evening. Um, Jamin, I'll start with you. I, I do, I do like, uh, you know, the thought that Magnus was a bit of a glue that it really wasn't necessarily obvious all the time what his value was. But one of the things that the team has had difficulty with since he left, and we talked about this on previous shows, but for, for the fans who may be new tonight, what we talked about was the difficulty that the team had playing out of the back and finding that kind of um, uh, way to play through. And it's, it's clear that the Quakes don't have the right player to be able to play with the back to goal, to be able to take up the same space that he was able to, be able to hold on to the ball, take a foul if necessary, and be able to keep the ball moving and find the space so that the Quakes could play out. They were able to successfully do this for the most part at MLS's back, you know, without Magnus. Uh, and they didn't really even face that much pressure tonight from, this, from Seattle. Seattle's not a pressing team. Um, and so they were able to move the ball a bit better tonight, but, you know, by then, you know, Seattle had pretty much, you know, already had, already had a chokehold on the game. Um, but I do think that the Quakes are, are missing the type of, of value that Matias brings. Now, is, is it possible that we could find somebody new in that position? We saw Eric Cabillo come in at the end of the game. We saw Tommy Thompson get a shot at playing in the 10 tonight. I, I don't think Matias has found an answer. I don't think the answer is Vaco. I think that that's been very clear. Um, so I see that Matias could still experiment. We could see somebody, you know, a new starter in that position potentially at the Cali Classico. And it's not going to shock me if it's Tommy Thompson. I don't know that he's the solution. I just think Matias doesn't have another answer. I definitely don't think the answer is Vaco, Jamin, because tonight it looked like he gave up. Uh, I think it was for uh, Seattle's third goal, I think, or maybe fourth. Honestly, they all blur together at this point. Uh, for one of them, he just let his marker run straight down the right wing and and uh, score a goal. And so I don't think he's out of contract at the end of this year. Uh, based on his performances, I, I, I can't imagine he'll be re-signed. So I don't think he's the answer there. Uh, and then again, I, I don't think the, the answer is in the Quakes lineup currently. I've said this on the show before. I think they're going to have to bring in a, a star DP quality player to improve this team's offense. 
Now, obviously, the offense wasn't their issue tonight. Uh, it was it was the defense, and and you know we've been talking about on the past couple of shows how you know really the attackers haven't even had much to do because the Quakes have struggled to build the ball out of the back. You know, guys like Andy Rios, Vaco uh, in the midfield haven't seen uh, much of the ball. Um, with that said, Vaco is clearly not the answer there. The Quakes disaster, disastrous night is finally coming to an end. Um, who knows what the future holds, however. As I mentioned, I don't think Matias has a plan B, at least not at this moment. Classico coming up on Sunday this weekend. It can get potentially very, very out of hand with Chicharito making his way back into the Galaxy lineup. From what I know, um, you know, the, the team has – a lot of reflecting to do. It has a lot, obviously, of improvements to do in the future. I just don't think it's going to come this season. I, as I mentioned before, I, this this winter is really going to be the real transformation. Um, and I think that even then, it's going to fall short. As, as we know, historically, the team hasn't spent. It's still going to be under a Fisher ownership. That is definitely going to impede the future of the club. Um, but the night is over. The Quakes lose seven to one. Uh, as Matias said, it's time to look on to the next game. I mean, sadly, that's that's where this is all at. There, there's there's no other way. There's no other direction to go in than than just move forward and think about the next game. This is MLS. This is what MLS is all about. Guys, I want to ask you guys a question because we saw Pavan run over basically Tommy Thompson in the last game against the Galaxy. Do, do we feel that the only potential solution to be able to control him would be for Matias to go back to Nick Lima at right back? Because tonight we saw that when Tommy went to the 10, Nick got put back to right back. Curious as to whether you think Nick Lima returning to right back could help control Pavan and give the Quakes a better chance against the Galaxy this time around in a in a home game. I think that's an incredibly astute observation, Jamin. I, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, in San Jose's last game against the Galaxy, a 3-2 defeat, Tommy Thompson was completely overrun by Christian Pavan. He just didn't have the pace to keep up with him, nor the one-on-one -on -one defending skills. Uh, and, and neither is Paul Murray. Paul Murray will suffer the exact same fate. Uh, and so I think the only option, the only fullback that the Quakes have on their roster that's potentially capable of dealing with Pavon is Nick Lima. And I think that, honestly, that might be their best combination of, of fullbacks, Lima on the right and Lopez on the left. Lopez was sort of all over the place tonight. He got dragged out of position a bunch. Uh, but right now, I think that that might be their uh, their best back line. Yeah, I agree with you, um, Jamin and Alex, with Nick Lima. He seemed to be a bit uncomfortable at the left back position. And the way that he plays or played for the U.S. national team, he plays a right back and then he cuts in a little bit um, and really, really controls that that right um, that right back position, almost stepping in as a defensive midfield player, um, playing very, very, very high. Um, and, and I think it would be time for him to, to get back there and, and have a go um, in, in that position and, and see uh, his uh, comfortability back there. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a nice thing to see Nick Lima uh, do pretty well back there. And that's kind of what made Nick Lima, Nick Lima uh, at right back. So um, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward um, to, to maybe seeing him back there if that's uh, the way that Matias Almeida uh, lines his team up. Okay, let's do the, the full whip around now and, and have our final thoughts uh, for this evening. Um, take it away, um, anybody. Go ahead. On the same day that Inter Miami signed Gonzalo Higuain, or that it was rumored to be official, the Quakes lost 7-1 to one to the Seattle Sounders in Seattle. That's the reality of this team. Have they hit rock bottom? I'm not sure. I don't think anyone knows that. But this is definitely quickly going out of control for Almeida and the Quakes need something to stop it before it hits the ground and it, it sets on fire. I 
I absolutely agree, Joel. Uh, this was a historic defeat for the Quakes. It was their worst defeat ever in MLS history. And it was almost, almost the worst defeat uh, in the league's history. I, I believe the uh, LA Galaxy defeated the Dallas Burn 8-1 back in 1998. But that was the only time that uh, a team has scored eight goals in an MLS game. Uh, the Quakes very well could have shipped eight goals tonight. Uh, Daniel Vega had a, a one-on-one save for Morris. He saved a point blank shot for Morris. So it very easily could have been eight or nine goals. Clearly, Seattle also uh, took their foot off the, off the gas pedal uh, in, the, in the last half hour or so. So I, I see no positives from this game. The only positive could be that this precipitates a complete overhaul of, of this organization. And uh, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen soon. I, I think that uh, I, I am very nervous about this weekend's game because the LA Galaxy just beat LAFC 3-0. LAFC beat the Quakes 5-0. That equals 8-0 in total. Uh, if, you, if you do some, some math there. Uh, See, so yeah, I think I think this weekend's game could be another big loss for the Quakes, uh, and and I don't imagine it's going to get better anytime soon. I think the one question that we were probably hinting all at with Chris Wondolowski tonight is the question of has Matias Almeida lost the locker room? Um, I think at this point, there's probably some doubt that's creeping in some of the players' minds if they cannot right this ship with two back-to-back home games, and they're going to be tough home games against the LA Galaxy and the Portland Timbers. If you start losing these types of games by these types of score lines at home, I do believe that um, it just is going to spell the end for the confidence that this particular locker room has in Matias Almeida. And it's going to require a massive overhaul of the roster in order to be able to get that confidence back. I just don't see that big of an overhaul happening. Uh, I don't think that Fisher has uh, the deep pockets to do what he needs to do in order to fix it. Um, I think there are situations like Alanis that are going to be very expensive to be able to address. Um, And so it's difficult at the moment to be able to find some hope. But this is soccer, and it it is possible to see these types of up and down sometimes with the team. If the team brings that 200% that Matias Almeida mentioned, if they can stay in sync, if they are all have each other's backs, if they are giving the effort that was clearly not there tonight, is it possible that they could come away with a result at the Cali Classico? I think it's possible. It's going to take some change to the roster. We'll see what Almeida does, assuming that Almeida, you know, doesn't walk away between now and then. I don't think he will, but you know, it's, it's hard to see that this, how the season is going to improve at this point. Yeah. Almeida is not going anywhere. Um, the ownership group, I, I think, uh, is, is, is probably, uh, keeping the team as well. Uh, Jesse Furinelli, he's been there for a few years. Um, and, uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Um, with that being said, uh, big squad overhaul in the off season. And we've said it on the show before, but, um, there will be, shoes to fill. And then I think that what you're seeing right now is, is Almeida testing out all the players, trying out all the players um, in match situations and going ahead and, and, and seeing who he wants and who he doesn't. And Matias Almeida has turned over teams before um, and completely overhauled squads before um, in his, in his time. So um, seven, one tonight, uh, a historic loss, um, for the San Jose Earthquakes, the worst loss uh, in the club's history uh, this evening. I want to thank everybody for for tuning in and spending their evening here with us. A chance to vent, a chance to share feelings, emotions, uh, thoughts, uh, maybe a beverage or a snack, whatever you decided to do uh, this evening. And uh, really appreciated having everybody on, uh, despite obviously the very uh, difficult loss for the San Jose Earthquakes team and this very challenging time that we find ourselves in as a as a global community, uh, not just in the Bay Area, but all over the world um, with the pandemic and uh, systemic racism in our communities um, that is um, that is going on. So um, just wanted to thank our viewership, our very loyal viewership uh, this evening uh, for for being part of this show. Uh, This is a community run show. 
I just want to keep stressing that to you. Uh, this is our 51st episode. So uh, we've gone over about an hour here and uh, we will be back with you soon. So like and subscribe to Black and Asul. Uh, tell a friend uh, as well about this. Uh, our associate producer that has been patrolling the flanks uh, in the comments section is Aaron Scholl. Um, Jamin Moore, um, Alex Morgan, Joel Soria, our executive director uh, and producer, uh, Jason Scholl. My name is Charles Woolen. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in this evening and uh, stay safe, everybody. And we'll see you next time.